Hello and welcome to the new books that work. I'm Pierre Delancey. For better or worse, artists write. By why would a visual artist write a novel? How should such a novel be experienced? How do artist novels compare or compete with literary fiction as we know it? David Maroto, the author of the artist novel, considers the proliferation of artists writing novels as a sign of the emergence of a new medium. Artists engaging this new medium do so in order to address artistic issues by means of novelistic devices, favouring a sort of art predicated on process and subjectivity, introducing notions such as fiction, narrative and imagination. Maroto's work is the first to explore this subject of the artist's novels in depth. David Maroto is a visual artist, researcher, writer and curator based in Rotterdam. And I'm very happy that he joins me now. Welcome to the show, David. Uh, hello and thank you. David, I'm super excited to talk to you. It is rare to, one, find a researcher who produces work about something that is brand new as a research concept. And second, it is quite rare to find a researcher who presents their work in a form of a novel and quite a page-turning novel as well. We'll get to both of these things. But first, I want to ask you to introduce your concerns and your practices to the listeners. And by practices, I mean in plural. You're a researcher, you're an artist, you're a curator and, and a writer now. All of this to unpack. So where are we? Where does it all come from? Yes, I'm a visual artist, writer, researcher, creator, like you say, but I like to simplify everything and just say that I'm an artist. Uh, period, like an artist mm-hmm. who writes as much as I'm an artist who paints. Yeah, I never became a writer. I mean, I'm a visual artist, specifically about the artist novel. I've been working on uh, this subject for uh, 11 years now. First of all, it was because I wrote a novel <laughs> as an artist. <laughs> it is titled Illusion. And then suddenly I realized that people thought I had become a writer, a novelist. And I didn't know how to explain that I was still an artist, but trying to use the novel within an art project. And then this inability to speak about my own work is what uh, made me realize that it was there was a lack of knowledge on the mm-hmm. subject. At the same time, I uh, met a curator, uh, Joanna Sielinska, and she realized that a very brief list of other uh, novels written by artists that I had made just to satisfy my personal curiosity she thought it could have been the base of uh, research. And um, that's when we started to work together under the name The Book Lovers, which basically has at the at the foundation of the project is the creation of a bibliography of uh, uh, artist novels and novels written by visual artists. If you want, we can mm-hmm. speak of the difference later. And, and a parallel collection. Uh, so far, we have found 608 titles. And oh, wow. yes, I, I am an artist, like I said, she's the curator in the team, but I guess, you know, she became also a bit of an artist and I also became a bit of a curator <laughs> along the way because we have been creating exhibitions, uh, performance programs, uh, we have commissioned new work, we have edited special issues in magazines and, and books, uh, we have published quite a bit too, so we've done everything that we felt had to be done around the subject of the artist novel and hadn't been done before. And of course, apart from that, I have my own, say, uh, autonomous practice as as an artist. But mm-hmm. this long introduction is to say that, yeah, research is really part of what I do. It, it became really an element of my own practice. So everything is kind of connected at the same time. Even when I work without Joanna, uh, all my work still is obviously connected. Uh, well, that's super interesting. And I, at some point, I might have to ask you about the relationship between your visual arts practice, you mentioned that you're a painter, and your novelistic practice. But maybe before we get to that, we, we have to look a little bit about some of the 608 novels written by artists and to, to, to think a little bit about what, what that discovery, that your creation of that bibliography means. So you describe this kind of perfect project where you, you, where you come to find out that there is a whole pool of data, all these artifacts, and not maybe so much research on them, but there's a crucial difference between some of the novels that written by artists that we might know. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see in the first pages of your book that Kusama, Pekabia, A. Bronson and Dali were all writing novels. I knew about mm-hmm. Dali, but maybe not, not about the others so much. 
But that's one pool of activity by artists. But there's another that you, you honed in. So maybe this is a good moment to, th- to jump in and try to figure out what it is that the artist's novel specifically is and mm-hmm. how that differs from the novel written by an artist. Yes, I use the term artist novel to speak about a new medium, let's say a medium in the visual arts, uh, so that artists employ the novel in their practice, in their visual art practice, exactly like they would do with video or performance or installation. So as a result, you might uh, have an art project where there is installation, there is a sculpture, and there is a novel. And the novel is placed within an artistic discourse, not literary. So from these 608 uh, novels written by visual artists, I say that more or less one third of them uh, they are uh, artist novels in the sense that I just explained. The rest are novels written by visual artists. What does it mean? Uh, it means that, for example, you have a, a Yayoi Kusama, you just mentioned her. She wrote uh, 13, I think. She's very prolific. Okay. But they are not part of an art project. They are, they are just mm. a novel that happens to be written by a visual artist. And a, a very good a legitimate question is to say, why should I pay attention to a novel written by a visual artist more than I would pay attention to a novel written by a sailor or a lawyer or a, or a <laughs> baker? And it's true. I don't have an answer to that question because that's not what I research. So mm-hmm. that's why I make the difference. There have been novels written by visual artists since at least uh, William Morris, so 19th mm. century. But the artist novel, as I explained, is a much more contemporary phenomenon. And I place the origin of it in the mid-1990s with Liam mm-hmm. Gillick, that in my opinion, he would be the first artist who programmatically employs their process of writing a novel as a part of an artistic process that ends up in a wider project. This connects with what I was saying before about the impossibility to speak about my own work 10 years ago was that I realized quickly that there were no books on the artist novel. There were no Mm -hmm. articles, no exhibitions. There was, in other words, there was absolutely no knowledge about this sort of practice. Uh, with an exception, uh, one article that I found by Maria Fusco, it was published in 2010 in uh, the Dutch art magazine Metropolis M, is the only place where I saw a specific mention to the artist novel. Apart from that, absolutely nothing. It's strange to say it, but absolutely mm. nothing. Uh, and that's why I started to research the subject, because if there had been what, uh, knowledge already out there available to me, I wouldn't have to produce it by means of research. And then it was also a problem for me that I couldn't situate my own practice in the field of the, of the visual art. That last bit of your, of your answer is quite revealing of, I think, some of the things that ends up happening to the artist novel outside of your research, the need to justify what it is that we do is, is something that your research really uncovers. But I think I want to, before we get into some examples, I want to talk a little bit about some of the methods for thinking about the medium and maybe some of the analytical tools in, in terms of like critical critical tools. So when I was reading the book, one of the parallels that came to me for thinking about the emergence of the medium, the novel as a medium within the visual arts, has been artist film and video. So for those listeners who are familiar maybe with the visual arts industry, you might be able to cast the last 20, maybe 30 years of artists engaging slowly but surely with the technology of video, eventually with filmmaking, and particularly with mechanisms like art funding, but certainly within the European context, there being some kind of demarcation and bit of confusion as to what becomes a film or a movie that belongs in kind of Hollywood treatment and what is an artist's film. Mm -hmm. And the difference quite often has been one of budget and audience and and kind of rigor um, and freedoms. So I think that's one thing to bear in mind a little bit. But from from your perspective, David, as someone who approaches these productions critically, how do you how do you treat the artist's novel like between those two extremes? Because they have in contemporary critiques very different apparatuses. We're not really in that kind of Butlerian 
mode where literature and the visual arts are one and the same critically. We really mm -hmm. haven't moved on and specialized. So yeah. what do we do with the artist now for? Well, you have to think that at least, well, more than 100 years now, at least since the time of uh, Duchamp, uh, in the visual arts, we don't define an artwork by any intrinsic quality. And the artwork is defined by the context where it belongs. So let's think, for example, of a urinal. When confronted with a urinal on a pedestal, the wrong question is to ask, what is this? Because the, que the answer is, is an object made of ceramic that you usually find in a public uh, toilet and you know people pee in it. But it's not giving you the answer that you want. The question is, what is it doing here? Mm. And, and that is a question that the ready-made poses. It, it actually creates a new medium in art. And mm. with the artist novel, I approach it exactly the same way. So is there an intrinsic difference between an artist novel and, say, a literary novel? Let's call it like that. Well, apparently, in principle, I don't think so. I didn't research that part either. Maybe somebody mm -hmm. will research that and will find that something that is intrinsically specific of artist novels that doesn't appear in uh, other kinds of novels. Maybe, I really doubt it. But in mm -hmm. any case, I don't think that's the question we should be asking. The, the, the thing that really defines an artist novel as such is that it happens within the art world. In other words, the artist tries to give answers to an artistic problem, this artistic problem. And it, it, and, and it finds in the novel, the, in the artist's novel, a vehicle or a kind of means to give answer to those problems. So I'm talking, for example, about the introduction of uh, notions that are traditionally ascribed to literature, mm -hmm. such as, for example, fiction, imagination, identification, uh, etc. But um, the fact that they have been a traditional ascribed to uh, one certain field doesn't mean that we cannot apply them to another field. And mm -hmm. so, you know, just in other words, I'm not interested in fiction per se. I'm interested in what artists can do with fiction or what fiction yeah. does to the visual arts. Uh, the same way, I'm not interested in the novel per se. I'm interested in what the novel does to the visual arts. In and I, I can summarize all this by saying that my research question is not ontological but performative. My research question mm. is not what is the artist novel. I'm not trying to define the artist novel. I'm trying to understand the effects of the artist novel in the visual arts, uh, the impact of uh, accepting a literary genre like the novel as a medium in the visual arts. Fantastic. Well, let's drill into some of the potential of performativity as you notice it in an artist writing novel. So your first case study is Benjamin Serra, whose project Mime Radio takes the form of about 12 performances, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Who is Benjamin? What, what are his performances and what, what is he trying to do off the page and, and on the page? Yes, he's a French artist who works primarily with performance and his performance at least at the time where uh, before meme radio uh, it was based on storytelling on stand-up comedian uh, uh, it was basically uh, always a kind of improvised uh, storytelling performance in front of an audience and what happened is that uh, he grew uh, increasingly frustrated with the fact that after every performance everything all the stories that he has been improvising and, and creating, they, uh, yeah, they went to waste. They disappeared. Of course, somebody could say, yeah, that's the whole point of performance, right? <laughs> that either you are there or you miss it. But uh, it's true. That could be true maybe 60 years ago. But I also understand that an artist in the 21st century has to deal with the problem of production. Like, yeah. uh, what does it remain from it? Can I actually sell it? Can I you know, make a living out of this? Um, so he had the idea that instead of uh, wasting the material, he would uh, record the sound of every uh, uh, improvised performance. Uh, moreover, he would connect uh, each performance to the next one uh, throughout an overarching plot. 
So mm -hmm. uh, even though the performances took place in different places around the, the world, every performance would be the continuation of the previous one. And when he transcribed the, rec the sound recording of every performance, that would become a chapter of a novel that he eventually published with the title uh, Mean Radio. So in this way, he was uh, giving answer uh, to an artistic problem, which is intrinsic to performance um, by way of the novel. Again, he saw a way to accumulate material even though he didn't change his artistic uh, processes, let's say. He was still an artist, exactly the same as before, but he was now incorporating the accumulative aspect of the novel where uh, eventually he would end up with a book published that would have mm -hmm. a second life, let's say. Okay, so this is already super interesting, but we still, I think the way that you structure your, your chapters and your case studies, we're still at a point at which we see this kind of very mechanistic type of engage, an engagement between the writing and another aspect of the practice. So I think it might be fair to say that the novel is it's sort of an afterthought. You, you said it's, it's a solution to a problem that the artists perceive. And I think what's interesting, and you highlight this in the book, is that that sets certain types of these artist, artist novels apart from other types of artist writing. So for instance... Yeah. The role of writing in conceptual art of the 60s and the 70s is, mm -hmm. is clearly very different. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what kind of tools the artist here needs to develop and, in fact, what kind of solutions. I think I'm right in saying that the novel in the end was ghostwritten. So what, what are the, what are the, kind of the, 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 the issue of production that you address? Like what, mm -hmm. what actually happens? What does the artist need to do? Well, actually, it wasn't ghostwriting because he produced the text by means of his oral performance in front of uh, the Apologies audience. to Benjamin for this, for this time. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> then uh, what happened is that it was uh, transcribed and then slightly edited to remove the contemporary moment of the performance. For example, mm -hmm. if during the performance he made a joke about somebody's uh, shoes, for example, because you have to think that in a performance like this, he was dependent on the reaction of the audience to yeah. orientate his own uh, narrative. Again, he every night he came up with the stretch of the plot he wanted to cover, but the narrative itself was improvised. So like a, like a, a stand-up comedian who reacts to the reactions of the audience, he also had to be very sensitive to mm -hmm. uh, make people have a good time and then make a better narrative out of it. So, uh, but then sometimes he would have to recur to uh, resources, jokes or comments that um, they don't belong to the to the fiction that he's telling, but is in, is intended to provoke a response mm -hmm. to the audience to create a kind of energy that keeps the performance going. But uh, obviously, for the reader of the artist novel, eventually those jokes, those moments that belong to the contemporary. Uh, moment of the performance, they are not relevant to the fiction and it would be actually mm. confusing. So the editorial uh, process was to remove that contemporary moment and to only stick to the yeah. temporality of the fiction that becomes actualized by every reader. Mm -hmm. Now, the question of, um, of production here, this is a very good example in that artists who engage with the artist novel in general, I would say that for them, and this sets also a difference with other artistic expressions that are uh, that use text as a mode of artistic production. Like you mentioned, conceptual art, they are different from the artist novel in that the emphasis in the artist novel is not so much on the text per se as on writing that text. Mm -hmm. so, so writing many times is more important to the artist than the text per se. What I want <laughs> to say is that uh, writing the process, the creative process, is already part of the work. So the contents of the artist novel are to be found in the process of creation as much as in the text that ends mm. up on, printed on the pages of the book. And I think this is crucial because that means that uh, when you read an artist novel at face value, like it was a novel like a conventional novel, uh, two things will happen. If you, if you are not considering factoring the creative process into the reading experience, uh, one, two things will happen. One is that you will miss uh, a large part of the contents of the work. Yeah. Uh, because again, 
Benjamin, Benjamin, he didn't write his novel. He didn't sit down and write. He said many times, <laughs> I'm not a writer who writes alone. I cannot sit down with a blank stack of uh, A4s and, and write. He is a performance artist. And this performance program throughout 12 episodic events that happened for two years, this is uh, not inconsequential to the artist novel. It is the, the, the central yeah. element of it. So uh, if you uh, choose to ignore it and read uh, an artist novel like you would read, I don't know, Paul Oster or Oran Pamuk or Alia Smith, two things will happen. Like I said, one is that you will miss the point of the work. And the second uh, very likely <laughs> effect that will have on the reader is that you will think it's a bad novel. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Because that's, that is one of my research questions, is how do you read an artist novel? And, and then mm. uh, that's why I say, well, read it like you would read or interpret any other artwork. Like you have to consider also the context, you have, but specifically yeah. the process of creation. Because otherwise, things that seem not to make any sense, that look like bad writing, you know, when you consider the creative process, then they make sense then there are traces of a creative mm. process that are part of the specific beauty of that text. But if you are ignoring that part of the, of, the, of the project, then you are going to end up with a work that you can neither understand or appreciate. Well, this is the central dilemma, I think, that you have contended with in your research. I wonder if I could ask you to give us maybe a little bit of a sense as to what the novel actually is, what the experience of reading this is. And you have just primed us with some of the context. I mean, I've, I've read your chapter describing the performances, but of course I haven't seen any of the performances. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are ready to consider the context. But I'm still curious as to, as to whether this is actually something we want to read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course, I can uh, read a few pages from uh, uh, Meme Radio. If it's, I, I will scream. If it gets unbearable, I'll scream. There has to be a, there has to be a safe word for every artwork. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, the thing is, most artists uh, consider their artist novels as autonomous works, and they want mm. them to be read uh, at, at face value. But I, like I said, um, I think you have to treat it like you treat any other artwork. Like it all, yeah, you can read it at face value. It, it is. A, it's possible. Why not? It's a possibility. I just recommend to contextualize what you're reading because then it makes a lot more sense. Now you're speaking like a real curator. So I yeah, understand. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, for example, Lucy Lippard in the 1970s, she said that already about the artist book, that some yeah. artist books could not be undistinguishable from a regular book of a uh, cookbook or a poetry book or whatever. Unless you place it in an artistic discourse, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, the last pages of chapter nine in uh, Benjamin Serrault's uh, uh, artist novel, Mean Radio. And the title of chapter nine is Marcia's Voice. So at this point, I should explain a little bit the plot. At this point, uh, there is a group of friends who gather in the Tiki Coco bar. Um, and there is uh, an open mic uh, uh, competition every night and uh, they re uh, realize that there is a kind of uh, invisible <clears throat> uh, presence in the bar uh, and they uh, they figure out it's Marcia, it's the, the, the mythologi mythological uh, character. <laughs> Only one of them actually can hear him. So at this point in the plot, they are inventing a machine that will render Marcia's voice hearable again. Okay. David asks, Benjamin, when you say that Marcias is here, is that true? Yes, of course. He's here in the room. He is very disturbed by the way he looks, and he doesn't want to scare anybody. He's always hiding in the shadows, so you never see him, but he's here. Wow. But if that's true, maybe there is something we can do. Uh, because if we manage to record his voice, maybe we can give it back to him, and he could talk to us. Benjamin is shaking and he looks at Marcias, who is now standing right next to him. Marcias, do you hear this? You could get your voice back. David looks at Benjamin. Are you really talking to Marcias? Yeah, he's here. He seems very scared. If it works, let's try it. 
David takes his computer and presses some buttons and turns some knobs. After a moment, okay, Benjamin, can you give the microphone to Marcias? In the scene that follows, David will use his invention to see Marcias because when Marcias talks into the microphone, the waves will appear on the screen and he will see Marcias appear on the screen too. This is how it goes. David asks Marcias to talk. Marcias is talking. I think I hear a voice. I begin to, no, we lost it. Here, here. No, I lost it again. Marcias, I think it works now. Can you say something? I hear my voice. I hear my voice. I hear my voice. It's fantastic. I hear my voice. Woo! I hear my voice. I hear my voice. David and Benjamin are both looking at the screen. Benjamin is used to it, but David suddenly sees the image of Marcias appearing on the computer. Ah, wow. That's, that's so disturbing. Marcias explains. That's why I have been hiding all these years, because I know I am a very starving looking person. I have no answers for that. It's disgusting. Sorry. No, 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 no. No need for, uh, no need to apologize. Let's put this behind us. I'm very happy to see you. It's just the fact that you are special looking, but wow, we hear your voice. Fantastic. It's fantastic. When Angie and Bernhard, Bernhard uh, hear this strange voice and Benjamin and David making so much noise, they run into the room. What happened? What happened? What happened? And David says, do you remember how Benjamin was talking all the time about this Marcia's person and we never understood what he was talking about? He's here. What do you mean he's here? Yeah, he's been here with us since uh, since the beginning. He's here with us. Look, Marcia's, can you talk into the microphone so we can see you? Marcia says softly, I'm here. And they are all, whoa, 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 aha, aha, wow, ooh, you, you have no skin. Yes, and he's very old, but he's here. Bernhard, who is one of Marcia's biggest fans, is so excited. Wow, what happened? Marcia's is here. Please, Marcia's, please, tell us some things. Tell us some stories, please. Marcia's is very, very shy since it's been thousands and thousands of years since he last spoke. And all these stories with Apollo really taught him to be careful. Thousands and thousands of years of being just nerves were not so easy. So he's very shy. Benjamin tells him, but, oh, yeah, 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 Marcia's, I have an idea. Maybe you would like to sing the song from the blog? And they all say, oh, yeah, the song from the blog, please. Could you sing it? Oh, yeah, that's a very good idea. We love that song. Oh, please, Marcia, sing the song from the blog. <laughs> they want to be sweet and welcoming to him. If you imagine a very stressed 100,000-year-old man, you would want to be sweet to him. You would not want him to be stressed. So they ask kindly, oh, please, Marcia, please, 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 would you sing that song? After a hey, moment... David, I, I, I think I can bear no more. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is, How will I mean, we have finished with think... the... Let me finish the paragraph. It's a couple of lines. <laughs> After a moment, Marcia says, okay, the song from the blog, the song called The Truth. Okay, I will sing it. And Marcia starts singing. Remember that each time he becomes audible, he appears on the screen. I, did, I didn't mean this as a, as a, as a complete judgment on, on the quality of the work, but I think that the phrase, you have to be there, is quite appropriate here. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm being mildly facetious, but also thinking about some of the you know, literary devices that, that you went through here. It's the way I've understood you've structured your case studies. This is an example of sort of lightweight engagement with, with the genre. I mean, I'm completely wrong, but this, this doesn't read like a novel that's been cried on and, and perfected with 75 editors. And no, but it's like I just explained. Um, it's the product of a performance. Yeah. And there was no editorial work other than removing, like I said, the contemporary moment that belonged to the performance yeah. but doesn't belong to the uh, narrative that is being told. So what you are reading is, is still an extension of the performance in a way. Mm. It, is, it is the outcome of a performance that happened, I don't know, maybe this one was in Los Angeles in 2014. That's why I say that you should read it within its own context. But it, it, that's true for any other uh, mm. You mentioned in a book that there is an affinity between an artist writing 
and an artist visual style. You point to some kind of aesthetic connection between one and the other. It might well be Kusama who you actually point to, but I early intimated that it might be interesting to think about your writing in relationship to your visual practice. So I, I wonder whether you could you could talk a little bit about how how one can even develop aesthetic markers by which by which we could be assessing this, like mm-hmm. you know, Kusama's novels versus her infinity rooms or her pumpkins. Like how <laughs> how do we even get the languages together to to compare the two? Yeah, um, when I wrote that, I was talking about novels written by visual artists, uh, meaning that they don't need to be artist novels uh, necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have to be integrated in an artistic discourse. And yet, in most of them, uh, there is a resonance in style between their visual work and their literary work. But I think that pretty obvious if you read, uh, for example, Salvador Dali's uh, novel, Hidden Faces, but it's just normal because it's made by the same person. But, you know, mm. there is this kind of Baroque, decadent yeah. um, taste that, is, yeah, you can almost feel it the same way you would feel it uh, visually. It's, like, it's a kind of tone. It's a kind of, um, yeah, it's the tone mostly, but it's also the style. It, it's also very clear if you read a uh, Karen Sitter's uh, novels, for example. Reading Mm -hmm. a novel by Karen Sitter feels very much like watching one of her films. You know, the the, the (laughs) pacing, the editing, the the characters, the way uh, they speak and and the action actually happens, it totally resonates with the the, the, her visual language, no? As As it's expressed in her video works. Um, so that's basically what I was trying to say, that even if you don't consider those artist novels, well, surely you might still see this kind of uh, echoes mm. yeah, between different disciplines. Be- beautiful potential for the Amazon shopping algorithm. Like, So if you have selfies in Usam- Kusama's infinity rooms on your Instagram feed, you might be interested in buying one of her books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. The circle completes. Unfortunately, only one is, uh, translated in French and another set of three novellas in English and the rest remain in Japanese. Let, let's think a little bit about the kind of success criteria that one might set for any artwork. And I'm and I'm not being difficult here, but, but this is something that I think is one of the main takeaways from your work. What kind of circulation might someone like Benjamin hope for in the production of this novel? And what what is the reality of what it's got? Maybe that's not the, the, the most kind of crushing question in this context, but I want to use that as a way to think about your final case study, which is a novel headless by the artist Golden and Senebi, with whom the ambition seems to be on a completely different planetary mm-hmm. scale. But I'm guessing in the end, the results might be quite similar. So mm-hmm. I don't know whether this is maybe a very clumsy way to 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 phrase the question, but I want to consider mm-hmm. a little bit about what actually happens to these novels when they when they're written and what might that mean. Yes, yeah, that's a very uh, central question actually, uh, because in the case of uh, Benjamin, he was very aware of it, I think of the context where his uh, artist novel would be circulated and 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 what his readership would be like, but. That's unlike most of the cases I've seen uh, in in most of the artist novels. I, I've done a lot of interviews with many, many artists. Mm-hmm. And my first question was always, uh, why? Why would you turn to the novel as a medium in, the, in your art project? And then I started to see a kind of pattern. Uh, there was a sort of a desire to use the novel as a platform to uh, reach uh, audiences beyond the art world. Yeah, I said it in a very simple way, mm-hmm. but uh, this encapsulates a certain desire. The desire that by co-opting, let's say, uh, an existing uh, form, you could potentially reach audiences that, for example, you speak about Golding and Senevi. Uh, they said that the idea of uh, creating an artist novel, uh, theirs is titled Headless, it first came to them when they were in uh, in an airport, uh, in a bookstore, in an airport, and then they saw all this, uh, you know, uh, cheap uh, fiction like detective novels and so on, that are meant for someone just to read on the plane and so on. Mm. 
So they uh, fantasize that, uh, well, you know, a, a traveler rushing in the JFK airport goes to the bookstore and instead of uh, grabbing the Stig Larsson novel or the Da Vinci Code, they would uh, just grab the one next to it, which is headless, right? And, and, and that way, you know, they would inadvertently, they would actually um, be getting into Golding and Senevi's project because they managed to uh, reach beyond the art world, to reach uh, audiences that are in the real world, let's say, by means of um, using this, the distribution system, the publication system of uh, commercial fiction, let's say. Well, that's what I call the fantasy of the novel. What I just described mm. is a fantasy. A fantasy is a term that comes from uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, fantasy is not a desire. A fantasy is a visual expression of a desire. It's, it's an imaginary scenario in which the subject uh, fulfills his or her desire. And uh, Roland Barthes uh, uh, speaks about the fantasy of the novel in the sense that fantasies are not only sexual, it could also be, well, the novel already exists. There, It has a very long tradition for centuries. So it, 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 is already, it already exists as a kind of object of desire, like somebody, yeah. and art is included. That's, that's the difference also, like you were mentioning before, about art uh, writing. This is not art writing in general. This is a very specific choice. I want to write a novel. It is the declaration of a desire. It is um, you are engaging with a sort of, with a form, with a genre, uh, that has a, a very long tradition, but also with expectations of the reader. When you take a novel in your hands, you already you are used to read a novel. You, you, your, your, your expectations are set in a certain way. So uh, the artists want to use that. They want to integrate that into their art practice. But then again, I call it a fantasy. Why? Because one thing is a fantasy, which is I want to see my artist novel sold in art bookstores, sorry, not in art bookstores, actually, <laughs> sorry, that was a lapsus, in, in airport uh, <laughs> bookstores, um, but did it ever happen? No, it never happened. That's why I still research the artist novel as a fantasy rather than an existing reality in the sense that enlarging the field of contact with a larger audience it didn't really happen yet. What I want to say mm. is that readers of Headless, people who uh, buy the artist novel Headless, they do it because they have an interest in Golding and Senevi's work. Because they are the readership is still within the art world. Headless still belongs to an artistic discourse. It belongs to the, the discourse of contemporary art. In, in that sense, a very important element of my research is to understand the, the, the distance between the fantasy, which is a necessary step in any creative process, and the actual life of the artist novel in the world. Hmm. Well, what strikes me is that the word fantasy and this whole process you describe is actually quite emblematic of plenty of moves that art has made over the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I referred earlier to artist film and video. I, I, I'm probably going to misattribute a line that I can't quite remember, but I remember someone vaguely relevant talking about Steve McQueen and his, his transition from artist film production into, into Hollywood mm -hmm. and how, how that essentially kind of illustrated that all artist filmmakers essentially want to have the fantasy of being Hollywood film directors, but they fail, so they keep on making their low budget you know, 5,000 euro kind of productions, and which is, of course, a stupid thing to say, but, but it does illustrate the fantasy. Thinking out loud, I would possibly even venture that certain aspects of art engagement in social practice, that is, mm. art inserting itself into things like social work and politics, that's also part of the fantasy. They yeah. might want to make artistic interventions into the world, but they also might want to be elevating the status of the artist as an author within within those realms. And that, that's quite a serious consideration, mm -hmm. which I think isn't really paid attention to, because it does create, that really paints the artist in a very different dif different light. It's not just kind of yes. experimenting, we're benevolent here, but we're also actually trying to cut out a space within society and its 
culture, but also economic structures and, and all these other symbolic realms. I wonder, I wonder if we can do this without going all the way into the intricacy of headless, which is, I mean, this is the one, one of your case studies that I have actually read in part because the Golden Cenobi I had some contact with over the years and it occurred to me that I don't actually know that who in this murder mystery novel done it because I only read it in one of its like half complete mm -hmm. iterations. But I wonder whether without explaining absolutely everything that happens with this novel is whether you could think about how artists are able to, but but maybe are not, and why they might not be able to to reach that fantasy. Why 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 is Headless a novel that as a as a mass market circulation novel a complete failure? Why is it published by Sternberg, lovely mm -hmm. publisher, mm -hmm. and not by Penguin or or many others like it? Yeah, that's the main, that's the that's the question. <laughs> in in my in the chapter that I uh, uh, dedicate to to this project, I explain how the process went. They first of all they didn't write the novel. They uh, set up a series of artistic events, performances, and stuff that, uh, and then they hired a, a ghostwriter. Uh, he is a professional uh, detective fiction uh, mm -hmm. writer, uh, John Barlow. So his mission was to translate all these uh, artistic events set in place by Golding and Senebi into the plot of a mystery novel that would end up being headless. So that means that there was no plot. Uh, John Barlow, always, a good, always a good, always a good start for a novel. I exactly. Think. So John Barlow wasn't also the author of the novel because he had to be waiting for the next event to happen in order to fictionalize it. Hmm. And then the new chapter that he wrote, as a result, would be the basis for the next uh, uh, art event that the Golding and Senebi would organize. Maybe reading this chapter in a certain setting or whatever. And that so there was this uh, kind of. Um, ongoing overlapping between uh, uh, fact and fiction. It went on for seven years. Uh, that means that Golly and Senebi are not the authors of the art in all. Mm -hmm. They didn't even write it. Uh, John Barlow is not the author of the art in all. It, it's a kind of, it's like a headless, it's, it's a good metaphor. It's like a body without head. It, the novel proceeded, the writing process proceeded like without anyone at the wheel, let's say. Okay, so you end up uh, at the end with a manuscript and they try to pitch it to a, a mainstream publisher, not to one, to several, and it was always rejected. They hired an agent. They asked uh, John Barlow to rewrite the, the whole thing to make it more marketable, let's say, or more attractive to mass uh, audiences. But uh, the result was still the same. I have one of the letters of uh, rejection, which I mm -hmm. produce in my book. And it really, ex uh, you see that the publisher says, look, there is nothing wrong with your uh, project. I think actually it's brilliant. It's, it's amazing. But I cannot possibly publish this. I'm going to lose money because, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, okay. And then my point is, if what you want is to write uh, the Da Vinci Code, you sit down and write it, yeah? And then you follow all the conventions of the genre, go, you know, and then you you play the game in the commercial mm. fiction industry and maybe you win the game. But what the Goli and Senebi were doing was an art project that involved uh, literally hundreds of people, a lot of uh, art events creating a sort of, uh, yeah, machinery that was creating a text along the way that pretended to be something that is not. Publishers can see through that. They are not as stupid. I mean, people outside the art world, you know, they, they see it. It's like this kind of arrogance that is very typical of the art mm. world, thinking that you can co-opt any existing structure and, you know, turn it for your own uh, purposes. Well, at the end, uh, the publisher is an art book publisher, Stenberg Press. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that. I think it found its place, but it means that the distribution is going to be in uh, museums, art bookstores, like specialized uh, audiences. The readership didn't change in the slightest. Now, when the difference between the fantasy and the reality of the work in the world is so large, 
I think it's legitimate to speak about failure. Uh, but mm. again, I don't think it's a, in this context at least, I see it as a kind of generative event. It clarifies, it illuminates so much, uh, so many aspects of how the art world works and, and how <laughs> it doesn't work that uh, we can learn so much from it that I think in this case, uh, specifically uh, being a failure is just a very productive event. And also I have to say that uh, I'm not condemning uh, fantasy. On the contrary, it's, it's a necessary <laughs> element of uh, any artist knows it. You first have to imagine mm. what you want. You have to picture it in your mind and then you set up to produce in reality this image that you have created in your mind. And then this degree of separation that inevitably happens between your fantasized work and the actual work, it creates this kind of little dissatisfaction that maybe makes you, you know, try to want to try again. It's a process that any artist knows very well. Now, when this gap is too large, yeah, then I think, you know, this degree of separation is too large. Yeah, like in Headless, I think it's legitimate to speak mm. about failure. You know? Yeah, well, Headless has definitely been, from my perspective, of someone on the margins of it and who, who's hang out with the artist a little bit, a complete joy. But I think I think it's important to also acknowledge that the artist novel, as much as it's almost by definition still in the margins of the mainstream publisher world and mainstream readership, but also still has a, a very marginal position even within the art world mm. and kind of Golden and Senebi to a certain extent were the, the worst artists to popularize the genre. Like the, the, the amount of resources and, and ingeniousness and the, the number of people's input that that book took versus who these two artists are and their method, it's, it's, it was almost designed to produce this failure. And mm. to a great extent, I think, you know, for, for, as a bystander or a reader, I've, I think this has been a fantastic effort. But I found, for instance, when I was on their behalf trying to distribute some advanced copies. Well, I found that occasionally even the people within the art world couldn't quite mm -hmm. follow what was what was yeah. happening. David, be before we run out of time, I really want to not miss the other half of the research, because we've been talking so far about a red book from the artist's novel called A New Medium, which has all the contents that we've addressed, the, the theoretical investigations and the case studies, and also interviews with artists and quite a beautiful bibliography of artist novels, which I recommend to anyone who might want to get lost in good and bad and an intriguing artist writing. But a second part of your project in black is the artist novel, the fantasy of the novel. So we've been talking about the fantasy and here you really deliver research by practice like I've never seen it before. And, and you've made the best case possible for actually doing what you preach and learning from it that I've ever seen. So the fantasy of the novel is your own novel. And it's a novel written from written by a character called David Morato. I imagine he's you, but he's not always you. Um, a lot of people, some, of the, some of the people you've mentioned are also in the novel. Some of the people I know are in the novel, which is a little bit uncanny, and uh, but also has helped me read it all in one sitting and, and not get any sleep, so thank you. But what happens in the novel is that you describe yourself commissioning an artist to write an artist's novel, which isn't as complicated as I've made it sound, but you get to really work through so many different things. So I, want, I wonder if I can ask you to try to explain a little bit <laughs> why and yeah. what and, and whether you're okay, because the novel doesn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, let's just start from the beginning. Let's uh, remember that um, the reason, the origin of these two books, which are one book in reality in two volumes, uh, the origin is in my PhD, the, a PhD that I did in the Edinburgh College of Art uh, with the supervision of Maria Fusco, whom I mentioned before, not by chance. When I was uh, researching the artist novel, and then I realized, uh, like I said before, that the contents of the work in the case of the artist novel are located in the process of creation as much as in the text that results from that create uh, process. Uh, at the same time, I found that it was uh, the, there was a little contradiction because I was only researching artist novels after the fact. 
I was mm. doing interviews. I was reading the artist novels. I was uh, reconstructing those processes by means of documentary materials, uh, archival materials, but I wasn't engaging with the process uh, in real time. So mm. at the same time, uh, uh, through my collaboration with Joanna Zielinska uh, in The Book Lovers, we were able to convince the Ujazdowski Castle Center of Contemporary Art in Warsaw to support a project that we wanted to, to pitch, uh, which was basically we wanted to uh, commission a, a, an artist to create an artist novel for two years. So um, the production would be supported by the Ujazdowski Center. The, we, we published an open call, and this would be an open call for art projects. The only mm -hmm. condition would be that a novel had to emerge through this project. Uh, a novel had to come out at the end somehow. And this somehow would be dictated by the terms of the proposal yeah. that was submitted. We received 230 applications. And we, uh, long story short, we selected one by Alex Spaghetti called uh, Tamam Shoot. And he claimed that he, by means of five episodic performances and one exhibition, he would create a murder mystery uh, story that he would then write up as an artist novel, which we eventually published. So just to clarify, Tamam Shoot is a novel by Alex Cecchetti, the creation of which is the subject of your novel, the fantasy of a novel. On the one hand, we have the book lovers. This is real life. We are yeah. commissioning an, uh, uh, an Italian artist, Alex Cecchetti, to create the, his own artist novel. Now, the project could have ended there, like a curatorial project, it's a commission, mm. that's it. But at the same time, I was doing my PhD. And then I thought, okay, I can use Tamam Shoot, that, that is Alex's project, as a key case study in my research. So I could use the opportunity of commissioning an artist to create an artist novel to observe the creative process live instead of in retrospective, in, instead of trying to reconstruct it after the fact. So it was a really unique uh, opportunity to actually research uh, the creation of an artist novel as it happens from the fantasy, yeah. right? From understanding the desire of the artist to, well, the moment when this artist novel is actually published and read by an audience. Um, what happens is that while I was researching, I realized that in order to make justice, to do justice to the process, the best way to write about it would be in a narrative form, uh, which means that the aspects of the creative process I'm interested in um, would be better expressed if I fictionalized the mm -hmm. whole process of creation. So if I kept writing a conventional academic essay, uh, the aspects of the creative process that I'm interested in would be uh, unreachable. Like the, the, yeah. I, couldn't, I could not express them properly to the reader. So um, by turning real people into characters, conversations into dialogues, and actual events into situations in a, in a novel, I could really... Um, uh, engage with aspects of reality that uh, usually um, are not visible to the art audience. Yeah. And I'm talking about conversations over a dinner where, you know, key aspects of the budget are discussed, uh, personal affinities that make things possible or mm -hmm. conflicts between producer and artist or, yeah, affinities between the uh, art, the director of the art center and the artists that make things possible that otherwise wouldn't, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in other words, a lot of this sort of knowledge usually circulates in the art world in the form of oral transmission mm -hmm. as gossips or anecdotes. And anyone who belongs to the art world knows how valuable this kind of uh, knowledge is, but is rarely committed to writing. So basically, uh, by fictionalizing all these events, I could give a complete picture of how an art project actually comes to being, the, the reality of art as it happens. So uh, when, you, when I describe, when I narrate a certain performance, I also narrate what happened before the performance and after the performance, yeah. 
what happened in the minds of the audiences and whatever conflict that you know prevented something from actually uh, being part of the performance but the artist would have uh, wanted otherwise etc cetera, etc cetera. so all these informal factors eventually really affect the production of, of what is possible to be produced in in and what is going to mm -hmm. be the experience of the audience eventually so how how do we take it next how to unravel because i i wanted to accuse you a little bit in to doing two things at the same time in here so one you are a curator commissioner working with alex chiquetti to produce his fantasy of a novel and his mm -hmm. fantasy if we if we believe if we more or less believe the the records that you present in your own novel his project was trouble, like like most of the projects that we described here. It starts with a fantasy, everyone means very well, but it turns out that you know producing five performances in an exhibition and commissioning all sorts of artwork is a very inefficient and expensive way of writing a novel, particularly yes. a novel that <laughs> you will only print 300 copies of or thereabouts. But what do you have ended up writing yourself? The black book that I referred to earlier, the fantasy of the novel that in the title, is actually, I think, a curator's novel because there's no failure to produce your own novel. You have produced a very readable novel, which, which I, I wonder whether it's the opposite of a compliment in the context we're talking about. So, what? Why do you get to have your own cake and eat it? Why? Why do mm -hmm. you get the fantasy of a novel and your characters don't? Or yeah. more importantly, the artist who you commissioned as a curator, so if I can <laughs> up the stakes a little bit. Yeah, uh, in order not to confuse the audience, let's try <laughs> to keep, uh, again, separation between Tamam Shoot, which is artist, uh, the artist novel that we commissioned, Alex's novel, artist novel, and then the fantasy of the novel, which is uh, my uh, research on Tamam Shoot, but it's written as a novel. Because... Yeah, I didn't really write a novel. What I wrote was a work of research that um, is written as a novel, right? So, again, my desire was not to write a novel, but to use uh, elements of creative writing at the service of uh, research. So I th think that's uh, very important because, again, I wasn't exactly free to write whatever I wanted. I was subjected to uh, research. Actually, uh, I had to struggle a lot with the use of fiction in uh, research mm -hmm. because abusing it would have undermined the research value of my own project. Uh, because if I say that, uh, yeah, the artist novel that I'm researching was beamed down by a UFO, I don't know, maybe it's a good story, but, you know, it wouldn't uh, teach you anything about the reality of, uh, of the production of an ar artist novel. So I had to administrate fiction very, very carefully to make the reader turn the next page. Yeah, to, I, I also wanted to write in the most conventional way. I wanted to write the most conventional novel possible so that the reader can uh, doesn't need to make an extra effort to understand the contents of what mm -hmm. is written. Yeah? yeah, I wanted to use you know these kind of cognitive skills that are already built into the reader. Going back now to Tamam Shud as a uh, curatorial project, uh, production project. Normally, uh, like I said, these informal factors, uh, for example, if there is bad blood between the artist and the curator, uh, normally, yeah, you work for months to prepare an exhibition, let's say, but it really is the last three months that you really work closely mm -hmm. with the artist. And if there is bad blood, if there is, you know, bad energy, it doesn't really matter. After the opening, you split ways and you don't have to deal with each other. Mm. In, in the case of Tamam Shud, uh, we were uh, contractually obligated to work for two years because that's what the yeah. what that was the basis of the whole project. Uh, you don't write a novel in two days, right? So we offered ample time to the artist to display this whole project, and you know, writing and art making would go together, but it needs time to to develop. But of course, these subjective intersubjective relationships. Uh, start to wait heavily over time because you cannot walk away. You are still, you know, you still mm. have to fulfill your duty. And I'm talking about the curators, the designers, the producers, everybody who is involved in the creation of an art project. Um, so then you have the conflict that uh, the artist has a vision. Let's call it an ambition. Let's call it a fantasy. 
and the artist will not hesitate you know to to do anything in their capacity to fulfill this fantasy to 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 make it real and sometimes it's about seducing the vice director of the art center sometimes it's about you know entering to conf- because that's the thing with fantasies that the moment you imagine them you entertain them in your imagination they work perfectly smoothly mm. but the moment you want to play out this fantasy you are going to uh, find a lot of obstacles and the first obstacle you will find is the desire of others so that's the <laughs> that's the difference between fantasy and reality and in the specific case of an artist novel like tamam shoot um, yeah, you have a lot of people working there. It's not just the artists. It's, the, like I said, curators, producers, even the audience also plays a role here. And it all affects the, the direction of the, of, the, of the project. And that's where the conflict happened. And that's where um, I got elements to write about, the dramatic element of my <laughs> novel. They is, uh, well, I exaggerate a few things. Like I said, I was trying to keep the reader reading in the sense that I, I wanted the, the, the access to the contents of my research to be as direct and clear as possible. But I also have to mention my second supervisor, Jane McKee, from uh, the, the English Literature Department in the University of Edinburgh. And she really helped me a lot because I don't think mm. I'm a good writer at all, at all but she really helped me a lot, you know, along the way to make this novel readable, at least. Well, I recommend the fantasy of the novel to anyone who maybe is interested in palace intrigue. <laughs> but I want to use the last lines of the novel, the fantasy of the novel, to ask you about what you're doing next. So to not blow anything too much. Things come apart a little bit in these relationships, as you, as you intimated, between some of the characters in the novel. And then you describe in the epilogue a moment of recovery. This is your character finishing the book. I make a resolution, an unexpected one that implies the return to art, to life, to the fantasy of posterity. And with it, I return to conflict and disillusion. And so what? It's decided. I'm going to write a novel. Maybe one, one has to read it all, but I, I see this as, as a revenge, essentially. And on that note, I want to ask you what happens next in your practice. Is there a literary career awaiting? Should we, <laughs> should we, be, should we be looking for, out for your name at the airport? Or are you, are you reverting to curatorial work or, or maybe your practice as, as an artist? Yeah, like after I published this book, my interest has like, it, it goes in two directions. <laughs> One, I'm very interested now in the origin of writing. So I approach writing not as a symbolic, as a means to um, express symbolic meaning, but rather as uh, indexical traces. No, uh, um, that even if you don't know what is written, there is still a level of communication that you still get. I'm talking about uh, the origin of writing. I'm investigating um, cuneiform clay tablets from. Uh, mm. uh, Mesopotamia, and I, I've been looking for non-linguistic traces like fingerprints, fingernail prints, etc. I'm uh, learning a lot about what writing, how writing came about, which is surprisingly close to sculpture, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to create a sort of artistic voca- vocabulary that uh, doesn't rely on writing. So I'm trying to replace all writing by, yeah, the oral transmission of these contents. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. about writing without writing, and it's 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 about the origin of writing, and it has a lot of uh, sculpture, mural painting, drawing, and performance. It's all connected in a body of work that creates its own say institutional frame. Yeah, but an institution that doesn't rely on writing, uh, which is incredibly difficult to do. Uh, when you think about the, <laughs> any artistic experience, is always mediated by writing and reading, mm. one way or another. And the moment you refuse to write, because writing is a technology that allows communication throughout time and space, so the author could be even be dead, but it still works. 
but that means that the moment you want to do without writing, you need to be, the author needs to be present. So while, but obviously that's contradictory with the idea of uh, in, uh, institution. It's uh, still ongoing, as you can hear, there is still a lot of questions no, no. I have to solve. But yeah, uh, I've been uh, working with the Netherlands Institute of uh, the Near East, and they gave me access to a collection of 3,000 cuneiform, cuneiform clay tablets. Oh, wow. I've made amazing discoveries, and I'm trying to well, articulate, like I said, a, a, a new artistic vocabulary to create this kind of transtemporal experience, yeah? something that connects us with the distant past by way of memory, but also with the future by means of imagination. So as you see, there are things that still resonate with uh, my research on the artist novel. Well, oh, resonate. I think, I think you're trying to negate your, your research. <laughs> you're just trying to undo it all. Writing has all been a waste of time and we should all go back to, to sculpting life. I think in the art world, specifically who writes, what do they write and how in the larger picture, it only serves to sustain a certain status quo of a uh, kind of industry of mediation uh, that maybe is not so necessary after all. I think artists can perfectly take that as an element in their own practice, integrate this element of mediation by writing or speaking or whatever, but integrate it in their art practice. So there is one element there of a lot of people who want to make themselves necessary when in reality, maybe it's not. And also, the art language, the, the language mm. that is used to mostly mediate the artistic experience is based on a kind of artistic jargon. Is Yeah, it's been called international art English. In reality, uh, nobody really takes that serious. Uh, I'm, I'm Okay, I'm using a very broad uh, yeah. overgeneralization, but the general feeling is that this kind of text alienates uh, outsiders, art outsiders, mm -hmm. and it creates this interest in uh, art insiders. It's a sort of style that was designed to respond to changes in the in contemporary art 60 years ago, but I think it became mm -hmm. a bit obsolete, and we need to find other ways to read and write about art. I'm not denying writing in that sense, in, in, but I think a lot of artists are actually using the artist novel as a way to actually uh, replace um, this critical art piece that is always not quite critical. It's also a little bit serving a little bit of promotional purposes. Uh, you know, mm. it's this kind of a strange blend. Um, so, and that's the second strand that I'm very interested in researching now is what, uh, what I call what some people call pictocritical writing in contemporary art and how we mm. can renew, because uh, one also gets a bit tired of reading about the crisis of art criticism or how awful curatorial writing normally is, et cetera, et cetera. Because as an artist, I'm compelled to make a proposal in positive terms to create something. David, thank you so much for joining me and I wish you all the best of luck and your literary revenge on writing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the conversation and um, goodbye. The Artist's Novel, A New Medium and The Fantasy of the Novel by David Maroto are published by Moose. I'm Pierre Dalancé at the Ezra as Marshall Pope. Thank you for listening and join us next time.